Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And we wanted today to talk a bit about a, sort of a seedy underbelly that is, you know, sort of an open secret within the video game industry and one that has come up with the recent release of Red Dead Redemption 2. And that is, I guess the simple version is talking about video game crunch, but I think it's a bit about the culture and the industry that creates that as well. Yeah, we've talked a bit on the podcast about, uh, you know, the ownership of IPs and these companies and the developers. And like when we talked about uh, trade and value in games and who really owns the games. But this kind of takes it a step further. So for those who haven't read it already, there's a Vulture article about making the making of Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, if you haven't read it, go read it. We'll wait. Thanks for reading it. Uh, I hope you paused it too. Otherwise, that that gap wasn't nearly long enough to read unless you're like barry allen or something it's the internet these things can happen <laughs> but um this article is an interview with the head of rockstar games and what went into making red dead redemption 2 which was a, a you know an excruciating process from start to finish finish it just took so much time manpower and hours but it almost glorifies i i I don't want to say the mistreatment, but it's kind of is the mistreatment of the employees. This idea that you're expected to work an insane amount of hours, put an extra time where you're not considered worthy and you could be fired or have your benefits taken away or something else or like bonuses or whatever. Um, the article will detail it much better than we will. We want to talk about a few bullet points, so definitely read that article. But it's been a talking point on a lot of other podcasts. And uh, having covered some of the other stuff we had wanted to cover and some uh, listener suggestions, we wanted to come back to this topic because for both of us, it's really important to acknowledge the industry besides beyond the game itself. You know, uh, it, it's really important to take that on. We talked about in the past about how uh, Peter Molyneux and the Fable trilogy and the bullshit he would promise and then the game would never deliver, you know, and how what you say matters. This is just another level of it. And for me personally, I think it's deplorable and horrible that um, these employers are put through the ringer to get this game out in a timely fashion just so we can play this game. It just the law of equivalence doesn't measure up to me. Yeah. And there's a reason why in these modern times, we work the hours that we work or that we are allowed to work those hours. Um, we are currently in a sort of uh, economical situation where the, the the work hours are starting to creep up a little bit again. And in the early 1900s, there were several folks, several in, you know, captains of industry that came out with the fact of, all right, look, if we work our people more than 40 hours a week, Productivity drops sharply, and if we make them work sixty hours a week for you know for week after week after week, it will pretty much be the same amount of work as if it was forty hours, and we're paying them for the extra hours. Why are we even doing that? And so that's why things pushed back. And of course, there is the idea of well, you know, there are employers that would make their employees work extra hours if they could, just to get more work done in, in less time. But it is about safety. It is about health. It is about all kinds of things which come up in in the article and in several others about video game crunch. And now there is the idea of, okay, ethical consumption. But sure. There's also, well, there, but there's also, and, and we'll get back to that. I, I'm just like saying, all right, that's not, that's not forgotten in all of this. Right. And on both sides of the idea of it. But there is also something that we've talked about before, which is entitlement within video games. And this, in this time, it is not about fans. No, I mean, definitely we, not. And this is one of those difficulties of... It, th this comes up in other creative industries as well as things become more profitable and you're able to invest more money or you need to have more investors from different places. Everybody needs to be pleased. And unfortunately due to either promises made or the needs of an industry that has to put out regular media updates about the development of ideas and a delay, you know, a, a release, a release delay is one of the, the most heinous things you can announce. And that's one where it does come back to entitlement across in industry and fans and uh, gamers. You end up with 
an absolutely unpleasable situation. And that is something that does not have an easy answer. But let's let's pick at the threads a little bit. Sure. I mean, also, when it comes to like Shigeru Miyamoto has famously said, better to have a delayed release and a better game than an on time release and a terrible game because one gives you time to fix it. The other is what it is now with patching. That's sort of not true, but still like, you know, horrible first impressions can crush a game. Look at No Man's Sky. It's now put out patches and added story and added more to it. And there has been kind of a little bit of a rebound for it. But the initial buzz of the game killed it for a lot of people uh, because of how little was there. Um, that said, of course, uh, not to mince words, me and Jeff don't own businesses. So there's a level of this where we're looking at it from someone, from employees, not employers, which is, of course, not the same. But that said, there are certain levels of expectation and dignity that are involved in, in your job, you would assume. The idea that, you know, these developers have to work these insane hours is not the outrage. It's that the higher ups would loom, you know, their bonuses or any or any credit on the game or whatever over their head if they didn't do it. You know, it's one thing to ask people to put in the extra work. You know, uh, Bethesda has often gone on record of some of their employees going above and beyond the call of duty, but it's not because Bethesda forced them to. It's because those people wanted to and Bethesda asked them to. And that's the major difference here that I'm not seeing. It seems almost like the heads of Rockstar are bragging about like what they do to get these games made. And like, there's no doubt about it. Rockstar is one of the most powerful game creators in the industry. They've, you know, they changed gaming with Grand Theft Auto 3. It, it's one of the most influential open world games to come out. It created that open world genre pretty much. You know, it had existed yeah. before, but like, they it, really, was a, it was a codifier. Right. And so there's no denying their importance to the industry. And the, every game they've come out with since is a marvel, even if you don't love it. For every Grand Theft Auto, even if it wasn't your cup of tea, graphically, they were always ahead of the curve. And, and that hasn't stopped. And, you know, think about L.A. Noir and the studios they partnered for that and the insane amount of graphical fidelity in that game. And then we found out after that game came out that the smaller studio they were partnering with were also pulling shenanigans as far as mistreating employees. And so I wasn't personally surprised when this article came out, but I was upset by it. Yeah, and I think it's also the fact that even though Rockstar is the, Rockstar is the studio that is okay very directly having a threat for uh, for crunch you know very uh, an ultimatum you know work crunch or else right i don't think that companies that don't do that are not also implying that threat right of crunch course. you know it is and it's in video games and it's in a lot of uh computer science uh industries as well but we mostly see it with video games because we are you know video game players there is a great deal of um, if you are not putting in all of these hours, you clearly don't care. You are clearly not working hard enough. And now, while I may not be a business owner, I'm an actor. And there's a reason why there are acting unions. Because, believe me, the amount of projects and people and what have you that have the either implied or explicit... A notion of why should I pay you? This is what you love doing. This is what you want to be doing. You would do this for free, so why aren't you? Or if you know, if you don't accept this amount of money I'm offering you, you know, a hundred dollar stipend for eight weeks of thirty hour weeks, I can find somebody else more eager, more uh, more hungry for it. Apparently, because you certainly don't seem to care about it. If you're you know, if you're negotiating for more money here, there's there. So many people waiting in line behind you. Right. Yeah. Well, that's like me working as a DJ and a host in the burlesque scene. The idea that, you know, you could die from exposure. This idea that people are like, oh, just do it for the exposure. You know, you don't need to get paid. We're building something bigger than us here. It's like it's a, a lot of that is a load of crap. 
because it is. at the end of the day, it's, you know, look, you should be getting something for your work. If getting a free drink or, you know, whatever else, getting a video of your act is enough, it's valued to you, then that's different. But you should never work for free. That doesn't mean you have to work for money, but you should be getting something out of an exchange. You shouldn't just be showing up to a thing and just doing your work for nothing. And a lot of these employees are salaried. Yeah. So there is not an extra compensation for this sort of work put in. And this comes back to the value of digital work. Um, this has been spoken of by us, by um, several other folks more well-researched, learned, and well-spoken than us, of the idea of once we start selling digital games, uh, what is their intrinsic value if we are taking out physical production costs, but we still run on old models on that. And at what value do we put uh, testing for bugs? At what value do we put, you know, the, the, the landscape artists, the animation, the textures, the, I am, um, I, in my research for this, um, one of the sort of anecdotal bits for Red Dead Redemption 2 is the idea that they decided that they wanted to put black bars at the top and bottom of the cinematics so that it would have a more cinematic feel. And it's like, all right, yeah, no, that everyone agrees. That's a great idea. Unfortunately, they didn't have the time to comfortably do that. So it became part of the crunch. And, okay, how, how much can we value black bars at the top and bottom of, of the, uh, of the cutscenes? Well, uh, I, I don't know because we're not paying anybody it, as well as the fact that you do this sort of work. And I brought up before the idea of when you work longer hours, you make more mistakes. And it's one thing to have a game that's not fun or a game that seems unfinished. It is another thing to have a buggy game. And that that sort of thing would get torn apart just as hard. And we want these things to, to, to be on time. And there's... Patches, of course, but don't you want the game to work out of the box? And the notion of DLC and patches is the biggest sort of we'll fix it in post. Right. And, and we've definitely talked about that before, how games have seemed unfinished or when they're, you know, we talked about the the uh, the horrible idea of DLC being worked on at the same time as the game's release, which sometimes does and does doesn't affect the core game. You know, and it all plays into that. Yeah, and it creates a notion of we need to get so much work done, do so much work. We'll deal with that later. Get all of this work done. Here's even we'll do we'll deal with that later. Here's even more work. And it's not a matter of look in a film. If you need to edit a scene differently, or if you need to do to to redub some dialogue, or if you need to kind of clean up the animation of something CGI or otherwise. That's one thing that may have an effect on the overall feel or runtime or something else. It does have long reaching consequences, but it can only reach so far in video games. Changing code in one aspect can wildly alter the entire gaming landscape um, in a, in a retro sense. Final fantasy seven has all of its debugging tools pretty easily accessible. Ga Game Shark and things like that are, are the the top of it, but there's there's ways to do it. And the reason that's all in there, normally you put that in, you you finish the game, you take it all out. That's for for testing and quality purposes, etc. But they were having such trouble getting all of the aspects of the game to play nice, and it was like, great, we've got a working build. Let's take those debug tools out. No, no, we're <laughs> not, because we don't know what that's going to do to the rest of the structure of this game. It could go wildly wrong. And you have big and little things, even in modern games, AAA titles, several, hun several hundred head teams working, uh, you know, 130 hours a week for three years at a time, you know, whatever all of that is. And you just end up with odd behavior, strange uh, interactions. And sometimes easy conditions that no one planned for that can make a game uh, lock up, have, have a software lock. 
and you have to reset it or you have to anything else that you have to release patches. And so even with all of these 80 hour weeks, even with all of these threats, even with, you know, implied or explicit, we are still running into situations where work still needs to be done. So clearly crunch isn't working. And I, I, I don't have an easy, I don't have an easy solution, but you know, well, I, I don't I don't know that there is an easy solution. I mean, but also you look at it this way, like there are plenty of indie developers that are taking their time releasing the game they want to release and not crunching or crunching on their own or crunching with reward. And like, it's not all the answer. I kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit and talk about like, we don't really talk about politics on this show, and I'm not going to get into mine that much. But I will say this, if you are an artist that I support, and you do some heinous shit, I will no longer support you. End of story. I don't need to support said musician who may have assaulted someone or some other musician who insulted a nationality or is racist. I just, I don't, I don't have the time for that. And your art is not so precious to me that I need to enjoy it. And there's a lot of like, when I was growing up, you know, separate the art from the artist and that, you know, you can still like their work, even if they're a heinous person. But the reality is there's, no shortage of art in this world. So that one thing that you don't enjoy from that person because they did heinous shit is fine. You'll be fine. You'll live. And so my stance on the whole rock star thing is that I have no desire after reading this article to buy this game. I mean, albeit I'm not a huge Western fan. You know, I played the first Red Dead Redemption and really liked it, but I wasn't like craving this game. And now that it's out and all the, the bad press, I'm like, do I really want to support a game company that does this to their employees? And the answer is no. And now I'm not saying if you bought the game that you're a terrible person. Like we all, Absolutely. we all have, we all have our vices, or we all still support stuff that may be questionable because you know we are human. We are only human. Or maybe you bought the game before you saw the article, or whatever. Or you're you're buying the game. You know, it, there are so many reasons. I'm just saying, me personally. After reading this article, I really have no desire to follow through and support this person, you know, and I think for me, it's just my own personal politics, but the reality of this idea, like, so this goes a long way to capitalism, obviously, which is what this all revolves around, but like people bitch about the DC movies, how terrible they are and how, you know, they're not well made, but then they still go see every one of them. If, if you're not happy with a product typically you stop buying it like if you buy a cheese that you don't like you don't keep buying it hoping they'll make it better you stop fucking buying the cheese but with with consumable media we don't do that if we don't like something we'll still consume the next version of it in hopes it might get better and that's not really how capitalism works if we keep spending the money they will keep making it. It's why I stopped buying the Call of Duty games and the Assassin's Creed games. Now, with Call of Duty, I wasn't a huge fan of it. But like the Assassin's Creed games, the quality just kept nosediving. Now, I've heard the more recent ones, Odyssey and Origins, are actually quite good. But like for me, as a, as a fan of the series, like each one was less fun than the next. So I eventually stopped spending my money on it. But there are so many people who will buy games by a publisher or or movies from a studio in hopes that the next one will be better. Like, I got to keep doing it. You know, I'll keep giving them my money and they'll figure it out. And it's counterintuitive to what we do with most other uh, perishable products or like, you know, personal items. You know, you know, if there's a shampoo that stinks, you're not going to keep buying it hoping they're going to make the shampoo better. And it's just right. strange to me that with gaming especially... For example, what we're talking about today with Rockstar, but with many others, like, I don't think their treatment is right. So I'm not going to buy the game and support this game maker. But other people don't seem to see it that way. And it's strange to me. Well, it's there is a difficulty of scale. Right. In capitalism. And I mean, that there's a lot of pieces where, again, trying not to get too political, I have some very strong political views, but without going too far, uh, there's a lot of environmental concerns in the world. Right. And it's sort of that idea of how could we use plastic straws? How could we use disposable cutlery? How could we do all of these things as if one person stopping is going, is, is what's just, you know, one person's actions are what's destroying the world on the consumer side. True. If, 
thousands, if millions of us, you know, rise up and decide, no more, we're not doing that anymore, that'll have an effect. But everyone's got different circumstances, and products and ideas exist for different lifestyles. But the people that are making these things, the people whose practices are causing a lot of issues, those, the actions of one person, can can have far-reaching consequences, whether deciding, I don't care, I'm making money, or let's find a better way, even if it eats into the profit margin a little bit. And I'm not sure exactly, I mean, I, I can't be certain exactly how far crunch reaches into every single you know company. I know uh, Tim Schaefer of Double Fine has spoken out several times against crunch spoken out about the the fact that in his own personal life he's he's had friendships marriages crumble because of the stress of this and that is one of the other big consequences sure you're getting your 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 bonuses but you're also losing your your life while doing it and i and i know that publicly or at least to my own public knowledge the the practices they try to do it double fine like even the uh oh what are they called the the the, the two week period where they just sort of like stop stop working on the projects we're working on just goof off just make some something weird let's yeah. let's, let's let's try to come up with some new ideas it's like <sighs> amnesia fortnight that's what it is yeah where it's just like and I, we like making stuff we're doing this because we enjoy making things no big deal if something doesn't work doesn't work just make crap whatever and then we'll get back to whatever else we're doing, you know, because, again, you you slog and you 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 worry about dissolution of teams and who's getting fired or who's not. It's, it's not a it's not a safe. It's not a happy work environment, but it has been made clear in recent years and in all of the decades of modern capitalism that there are. That, that, that there is sort of an insidious feeling that. Captains of industry, owners of companies will work employees exactly as hard as they can get away with. Not as not as much as needed, not as what is optimal. And this isn't everybody, and this isn't if you own a company, you're horrible. But there is a definite course and track that is well worn and well grooved of that, that will work people as much as they can get away with. And I really really want to feel that as a gamer, as a consumer, um, my purchases matter in, in a voice m- much as, as much as you were saying, Matt. And I certainly don't in, uh, I don't judge people if they, if they get this game and they want to play this game. It is, it's a game to be excited about. Yeah. Uh, I have not played the first Red Dead Redemption. I have not played Red Dead Revolver. I have not played, you know, any of those. Um, but that's on me. Um, uh, my, my, my backlog is known and storied, <laughs> that, and I'm that is true. And, I, and I'm playing some modern stuff as well. Uh, I just started Spider Man, but but it's and especially as fans, gamers, we feel in so many avenues like our actions and opinions do have weight. I mean, all you got to do is look at the pushback against Diablo Immortal. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, but uh, but and that's an interesting thing too because that we talk about the developers like Blizzard's reaction to to the fans was a la a fan reaction, you know, like they just got very outbursty and like, well, if you don't like it, tough kind of a thing, and it's like, well, yeah, but they also they they made it clear when so Blizzard at the BlizzCon announced Diablo Immortal, which is a mobile game that is being developed that is based in Diablo. Everybody expected them to announce Diablo 4. Now, Blizzard has made mostly clear that they are working on Diablo 4. Yeah. But that wasn't what the big announcement is, and that's not what the first thing is coming out. And Blizzard is a company that is um, legendary. Like, and I mean that truly, whether, whether truths and details are fudged, they are legendary for releasing a game when it's ready. Yeah. Things get delayed, things do, and I'm pretty sure that they still crunch. So what the hell? Well, yeah, and I think the, the the my biggest problem with Blizzard's reaction is like, you know, what are you so upset about? You all have phones. Just play it on your phone. And it's like, yeah, that's not really the point, Blizzard. Just like for the fans, 
like getting rowdy because you didn't get the game you wanted. It's not just about you. Uh, you know, we talked briefly in the past about how the outrage around the new Thundercats because it looked different. And some 50 yeah. year old white guy was like, well, I, I don't I don't like that. Well, it's not for you. Right. You liking I- cartoons is happenstance, but that's not what they're being made for. And not every release in a franchise, the, the the glory of a game franchise is that not every release is for everybody. Correct. You know what? I still regularly play all three Diablo. Like, one, two, and three, they scratch different itches for me. Right. And I don't see any one as inherently better than the other. And that is not a, well, I can't pick my favorite. No. They scratch different itches for me. And I love that, and I like that. And you know what? Diablo Immortal just might do that, but we don't even know. Right. And so we are the consumer pressure of, well, this better be good because either we've had to wait for it or it's part of the the, the great lineage of, of, of Red Dead Redemption. It better live up to that. This better be the best damn Assassin's Creed game that ever came out. You better really knock it out of the park with Super Smash Brothers or whatever. Yeah. That's the pressure that we're putting on, and that is that is the threat of benefits. That is the threat of so much, you know, where not necessarily the sales numbers because, yeah, people are just going to buy some of these things sometimes, and within uh, professional reviews where it can get a little murky sometimes. I mean, honestly, uh, everything we're talking about is quite murky. Well, yeah, I think also part of it is there's a sense of entitlement everywhere, you know, on the part of the industry, on the part of the fans, on the part of the like we we all as human beings have an overinflated sense of entitlement, some more in control than others. And I think part of it also is the idea that like I'm really down on on like I don't want to buy the new Red Dead Redemption, but there are plenty of other sources in media who have, you know, also rightfully talked about Rockstar and a poor light and talked about how this is unacceptable, but then still released their review of the new game. Now, again, they may not be buying it. They may be getting press copies, but still it's not, it's not cut and dry. It's not black and white. Right. And they are, they are under an obligation. They still need to, whether they like a game, don't like a game, a review makes sense. Right. And that there is some difficulty there. And there is the fact that, um, what you value in a game or what you need in a game is different than from what someone else needs in a game. Um, it, it was funny. Earlier this week, uh, my wife, Sarah, worked from home, and she took a conference call, and she was sitting with our video game collection in the background. And I recently built some shelves for it, so it kind of, if you're looking at it fuzzy, it looks like kind of a library. Uh huh. Like if you catch it in that sort of webcam angle. And so everyone at, like, offices that because she works for a company that's got several location offices and they're like oh my god are you gonna elaborate those are my video games oh my god what so she sent (laughs) so she shared our spreadsheet and there was somebody who i oh man i i I brought the story up and i wish i could remember the exact phrasing but it was basically like oh man how complete of a video game collection can this be you've only got uh two different fifa games (laughs) and you know what? I enjoy some sports games. I'm not a big sports game fan. Yesterday, I played Madden 2000 for the first time ever. Uh, my 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 home was an uh, NFL game day home growing up, and I'm just like, this is cool and all, but this is not what I value. But something like Red Dead Redemption, the the people I was playing with yesterday, they they were super excited about Red Dead Redemption too, and they were talking about it like they've it, one of them's already completed the main story and this is the other thing we are numerous we are loud and it is difficult to get a singular opinion yeah so i feel the if, if there is a singular like nerve cluster or a singular like all right here is a choke point on all of this employees employers creatives, reviewers, consumers, all of us. We, because we are many, because we are numerous, because they can fire an employee to bring someone else on, people hungry for work, so many companies, large and small, it is, there is no way to put value on digital work 
right now. We haven't agreed on it. There really, as far as I know, there isn't a, a video game developer union. So there isn't a uh, organized value on these things, on the amount of time you put in, on the output. Is it is it time put in? Is it code output? Is it results themselves? And there are people that work on the physics to make sure that the grass moves properly in the wind. And that's that kind of thing that when you notice it, oh my goodness, but it's meant to be more of a big piece of the verisimilitude of a living, breathing, open world. But when you say it out loud, it sounds really arbitrary. Or it sounds like, wait, you spent 250 hours animating the grass? I'm sorry, what what are we paying for? Well, you're, you're, you're paying for value. You're paying for a, a beautiful game. You're, you're paying, you know, the, but those are those things, too, that some people will watch trailers and complain about the, the puddles of water that were in a trailer that are no longer in an area when the game comes out. <laughs> and you must be cutting corners. Uh, I'm specifically talking about Spider-Man on I, that one. I know. like, So it's funny, having played a lot of that game, although I haven't finished it yet, the people complaining about how the E3 version and the release version weren't the same, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? The game still looks amazing. Like that That's the thing for me also is like, you know, a company like Insomniac, who's been making high quality, great games, and from what I've heard is one of the best companies to work for, uh, put out a game that in scope is probably as large as Red Dead Redemption, uh, to a degree, I know Red Dead Redemption is two discs and blah, blah, blah. But like in scope, they are similar. And like, I haven't heard any of these stories from Insomniac. So like clearly other companies are setting an example that it can be done a certain way that like when you say, oh, you know, you just got to bite the bullet. We got to get the game made. I just I don't buy that quite that much you know and the same thing like the entitled gamer who's like oh yeah you know defending this purchase they've made look as i said earlier i'm not buying the game and here are my reasons if you've bought it you don't have to defend it to me i'd love to hear your reasoning and your logic but like defensiveness is not necessary and there's a ton of that on the internet like who cares what the conditions were i just want the game it's not my fault i don't run the company is very dismissive like, yes, that's true. You don't run the company, but you're also spending money that fuels the company that's mistreating these people. And so while that not, doesn't necessarily make you a bad person, you are complicit in making a purchase that funds a company that mistreats its employees. So, like, you're not innocent either. And I think that's where my uh, issue is, is when you remove yourself from any form of guilt. Look, we're all guilty for a lot of things, whether we admit it or not. I think that the fact that a lot of gamers in the industry are just like, I just want to play games. I don't care about the other stuff is a very uh, naive way of looking at engaging with this art and medium. Yeah. We, we unfortunately uh, with as open of uh, communi- lines of communication as we have nowadays, we can hold developers accountable. Well, we can be held accountable because we, we can learn these things. Yeah. And there's the idea of, well, if I don't buy games from companies that crunch, then, you know, who am I going to buy games from? There are large and small studios and there are game companies that just release games when they're done. Um, and sometimes you just have to accept that, you know, these things take time. And if you want it to be good, yeah, it, it does. I mean, Kickstarter is one of those difficult aspects of, you know, nebulous release date or yep. when's it going to be done or whether or not a game is trying to get kickstarted for the development or for the production. I recently kickstarted a game uh, that they've completed the game, but it is a game that can run on NES hardware. So they kickstarted getting it put onto NES cartridges and a full, like, boxed release. That's awesome. Oh my God, I'm so excited about it. And it's like, it even supports like four player. It's a platforming game. Uh, we're, we're very excited about it. Um, I got for a delayed release because it's like, all right, it, it costs a little less and I'm fine with this game getting here when it does. I didn't know about this game till someone posted about the Kickstarter. I'm instantly excited. I can wait for it. Um, about, about two weeks ago, uh, Undertale creator Toby Fox released Delta Rune. Yeah. Which was, is a sort of first chapter pseudo demo for a much larger project. And 
he's come out and said, I don't know how long this is going to take. Yeah. Delta Rune's an idea he had before Undertale even, like design documents from 2012. But I'm not going to harangue that guy for taking his time on this. And he says he, he's going to need to get a team on this one. He did the lion's share of Undertale himself. And that is a game that has had a, f- a far reach to a lot, you know, to a lot of consumers, to, to media outlets and everything else. And I guess the, the only way to avoid crunch is to just do the whole thing yourself. It does seem that way. <laughs> but there, there is something in between there. And there is a, a big thing of, well, if a lot of larger companies need to take a lot of things down a peg, whether they need to take longer, they need to cut into their profit margins a little bit to better compensate their people, uh, whatever it is. And it's like, well, if that's going to shut down or, or, or dial back a lot of, of companies, if you find yourself in a situation that is emotionally, physically, mentally unsustainable for your employees, then that is not a sustainable work environment. No matter how you call it, it's like, well, we'll have to shut everything down and all these people are going to be out of a job. Maybe we have to do that to create a better work environment. Maybe we have to do that to create something sustainable. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, nothing's worth your livelihood, you know? Yes. Because, you know, what, what's, what's earning, uh, earning all of this money, earning all of this whatever, if you don't have a life to enjoy it with. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, so actually something, a reference point that I would like to attach to this, I, I've recently started watching Adam Ruins Everything, which is a comedy series that does deep dives into certain topics and kind of disperses illusions about them. Um, it, it's on True TV and the first season's on Netflix. And they did an episode about work and the work week and work environments. And while... A lot of it is played to comedy. There are tons of real facts in it. And, you know, this idea of us having a a five-day work week was not because it's better for our health. It's because Ford wanted people to buy his cars. And when they were working seven days a week, they didn't have any downtime to spend money on cars. And so he created this work week so they could have downtime and spend money. And so the idea that there needs to be this work week for these days is kind of not a real thing. It's arbitrary. Right. And so I think it's really interesting that we we assign ourselves to having to have this certain schedule and this certain this work time when in the reality you should be working till you get the work done and if the work is ongoing then schedule it at a healthy pace so you can rest be refreshed and continue working yeah and there that again comes back to the value of the work in the work put in and the work put out and you know, it, it is oddly mercenary, the idea of like, well, we need to give them more time so that they can consume our products. Well, if you're going to have capitalism, that's what you need. You need people to be compensated enough so that they can consume the products that are being produced. If you work your employees to death and they don't have a social life, they don't have an emotional life, they barely have a life that they're living except for work, then any amount of money they make isn't going to go into much. And... So there needs to be symbiosis. There needs to be give and take. And, you know, with the stuff I was saying before, I'm not calling for the mass shutdown of AAA studios. No. But, God, something's got to give. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, there's there's no easy right answer, but there are right answers. And I think... There, there are several right answers that can happen. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, too, like, the onus is on us as consumers, too. You know, uh, I have a, there are a lot of people who are like, you know, uh, to only get moderately political. When Louis C.K. made his comeback after being gone for a couple of months, after, you know, information about him assaulting and being unkind to women, uh, to put it mildly... You know, a lot of people are like, oh, he's back. We've forgiven him, mostly men. And it's like, guys, he didn't suffer for anything. And he's still getting away with it. There's no comeback. We shouldn't be supporting this guy. And, and look, if you're a Louis C.K. fan, fine. Like, I'm not I'm not going to fight with you because it's not worth the battle at this moment. But Fighting on the internet. <laughs> right. But the idea that, like, people have to be held accountable for their actions. And saying, I'm just one person, what does it matter? Those numbers add up. And yes, when it comes to major structural problems, maybe we can't fix things. But when it comes to consumable media, 
the money spent makes the product if you can speak with your dollars and it makes a difference and you know it may not stop things from coming out but i really think that financially i mean the, before origins and odyssey Assassin's Creed as a franchise was struggling financially. They weren't making a lot of money. They weren't blowing out of the park like they had been. And they did take time off. They stopped doing it every year. And then we got two good games that even though I haven't played have gotten rave reviews. I imagine spending less money on it, them seeing that people weren't happy with the quality inspired better work and better games. And we can get that from our work environments and from our products just the same. Yes. And... Our attempts at ethical consumption are not, and when I said that there are many good solutions, it's that fact that there is no one solution that is going to change everything. Right. And us, yeah, voting with our dollars is not even the biggest wave. But yeah, putting some drops in the bucket really does add something. And if nothing else, it helps you solidify your position with yourself. And we are numerous, we are vocal. It is difficult to get a singular opinion, but if you find your conviction, then by all means, stand by it. And we don't need to to threaten. We don't need to send death threats or anything like that. Um, I mean, Matt, you and I, we are saying how we feel here. Yeah. And that is our way of putting our voice out. I'm certainly not going to be sending angry letters. <laughs> no. And while it feels as though sometimes we need to all froth at the mouth in order to get anything done, in order for them to listen to us. We must uh, go on the aggressive attack. We don't. Um, and that's not a, a call for respectability, but it, it's just the fact that we are, we are a small turn of the wheel, but we are a turn of the wheel. And because it is a very large industry and a very large world, but certainly for our own social lives, for our own existence and microcosm it's a much bigger turn and it feels that way and you know uh, i i'm probably not getting red dead redemption 2 if not ever for a long time because i've got way better games to do yeah. way better games to play um not that i i think it's a bad game or anything but it's going to take so much investment if i gotta get it into red dead redemption just to, to play it so uh, is is that kind of a weak reason yes but the effect is the same. <laughs> yeah. I think at the end of the day, uh, you're going to consume what you want to consume. We just want to have a dialogue about this. Um, I would be really curious to know, because I know I know several of our listeners personally, and I haven't seen any of them post about Red Dead, so I'm curious what you think. Um, I have seen friends on Facebook post that article, the Vulture article, and then post that they're playing the game. And so I'm curious what your take is on it. How do you rationalize that? And it doesn't have to be a great reason or a strong reason. It's your, your reason. And I'm just curious to hear it. You know, I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to figure out how to make capitalism work best for us since it's a system that's not going anywhere. And at the end of the day, I would love to hear why you did or didn't buy Red Dead. And if this article has any effect on you, how aware you are of the development houses that put these things out. Because for some people, games are just games, you know, for especially young kids. Like my nephew just got a Switch. He's not, he doesn't care about any of these politics. He just wants to play fun games. So I'm curious as an adult how you process that. Or if you're younger than an adult, because, you know, if we have teenage listeners, I'd love to hear your logic too, since you have may have less of awareness of the stuff going on around you. Or or more. Right. And if you've purchased the game and then found out about the article after, like, how does that make you feel? Do you feel any guilt? Do you feel any regret? I'm just, I want to have a discussion about this because I think it's important. And we love when you guys engage with us. Yeah, and this isn't a new issue. Were there other games in the past? Are there other franchises, creators, companies that you no longer buy from? Not, not only because of a drop in quality, but because of what went into making it or yeah. the behavior of those that do it you know where 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 do your ethics and conviction go well, i'm i'm very curious i'm always interested in learning new things about the workings of the industry as as i imagine a lot of us are and because well we we shared ours we'd love to hear from you uh this is a conversation thank you for keeping it going i'm jeff moonen and i'm matt aka stormageddon